Hello and welcome to today's National House campaign call. I'm Sarah Sadian. I'm the Senior Vice President of Policy and Field Organizing with the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And we are going to get started in just one moment. All right, let's get into it. Again, hi, I'm Sarah. Nice to meet all of you on today's National House campaign call. Um, this is a campaign that focuses on achieving and advancing anti-racist policies and achieving the large scale investments that are needed to ensure that renters with the lowest incomes have an affordable place to call home. We launched this campaign because we recognize that we needed bold solutions more than ever and that we needed to make sure we are bringing all of the community together to push for those solutions in Congress. On today's call, we will have, or uh, participating, listening on today's call, we have advocates from across the country. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. We have folks who are homeless service and shelter providers, housing providers, housing advocates, resident organizers, people with lived experience, philanthropy and media on the call. So a really broad audience today. And today we're gonna to hear from updates um, that are on issues that are impacting everyone across the country. One is a new analysis from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities about a shortfall in funding for housing choice vouchers and the 24 budget. We're, we'll hear from Sarah's, uh, from NLIT's other Sarah, um, Sarah Abdelhadi about a new database that she helped create that will help you and your advocacy uh, back home. We'll have field updates from Kentucky and Nebraska and a Capitol Hill update so you know what is the latest happening here. But before we jump into the agenda, I just wanna remind folks that you can ask questions in the Q&A box. It's easier for us to follow the questions if they're in the Q&A box than if they're in the chat box. So keep that in mind and we'll try to get to as many that we can get to today. Um, we'll also share a copy of the presentation and any of the materials that our speakers share with all of you um, in the coming days. So you will get that in your inbox. Um, I also wanted to just remind everybody that we really appreciate you joining these calls. We really cherish the community that we've built with you over um, all of these calls in the past and going forward. And I just wanna make sure that you know that the comments in the comment box is really intended to help you guys make connections with others, to share ideas, to build community, to learn about what other people are doing across the country, but we also have to be respectful of one another. So just keep that in mind as you're using the chat box today. Okay, lastly, before we get into our agenda, I did wanna mention that tomorrow our CEO, Diane Yantel, is gonna be testifying before the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on competition and consumer rights in the housing market. She'll be talking about the state of the housing market and its impact on extremely low-income renters, uh, households. She's gonna talk about how the lack of housing options and the lack of renter protections uh, put renters at risk. It allows for this power imbalance between landlords and renters, uh, and it puts renters at risk of housing instability and in worst cases, homelessness. So check it out. I'm gonna share a link to the, um, Judiciary Committee website. Oh, thank you, Elena already did that. So if you wanna watch alongside us, um, you can do that and you'll see me in the back row watching with Diane. Okay, let's move on to our first speaker. We have Sonia Acosta from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, who's gonna share, us, uh, share with us some analysis that she's done on the short, possible shortfall of funding for housing choice vouchers in this year's budget. Sonia, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks to everyone at the coalition for having me, and great to be with all of you. Love seeing where everyone is from in the chat. Um, like Sarah said, my name is Sonia Costa. I'm a senior policy analyst, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, where my work focuses on expanding and improving rental assistance programs. Um, and a big part of that is doing that through the annual appropriations process. So um, we will be putting out a blog as early as tomorrow, but certainly this week kind of talking through, that goes through everything I'm about to talk about. So 
If you miss something uh, while I'm kind of going through the highlights, don't worry. I'll make sure that the folks at the coalition have the link to that blog and you all can uh, refer to it however it's helpful for you in your advocacy. Um, so just to kind of ground us a little bit and where things are with the appropriations process, um, the administration put out their budget request earlier in the year, and then the Senate and the House have both um, introduced their appropriations bills and um, the appropriations committees of both the House and the Senate have passed those. The Senate may be moving the uh, transportation and HUD bill. Uh, the House had plans to, but as folks may be aware, there's some other things that the House have to that the House has to figure out first before they can get to work on appropriations. Um, so appropriations this year are also limited to some extent um, because of the negotiated spending caps in the uh, debt ceiling agreement. And so the Senate followed those negotiated top lines. The House went lower. Um, so the Senate bills are higher um, because they were following those negotiated spending levels. Um, but the House is quite a bit lower in terms of numbers for housing programs, including for renewing existing housing choice vouchers. Um, and so if Congress were to use the, the House numbers, uh, we estimate that 40,000 fewer households would receive vouchers under that amount. And even under the Senate bill, which again is higher, but still below kind of what we estimate is needed, about 6,000 fewer households would receive vouchers. Um, so just to get into what that means a bit more, um, at the center, based on our estimates of HUD cost and leasing data that um, is publicly available and then projecting out the costs going forward, we really recommend that Congress provide um, the amount proposed in the budget in the administration's budget, which is $27.84 billion. Um, and that is the amount that will um, help ensure that the same number of families can afford stable homes through the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So because the House and the Senate bills provide funding that's below that, we expect that some agencies would not be able to reissue vouchers when they became available, leading to fewer households receiving assistance overall. We don't think that at the levels of the House and the Senate that people would actively lose assistance, which is good. But as folks on this call are probably well aware, existing funding levels for the program are already incredibly limited such that more than three in four eligible households in need of federal rental assistance do not receive it. Uh, and there are long wait lists for assistance in pretty much every part of the country. So we really need to work to at least maintain the level of assistance that we're at now. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of the data and, and why we're saying that a little bit more than what's in the Senate bill is needed. So it's very common for estimates about renewing housing choice vouchers to fluctuate throughout the year um, because they're based on actual cost and leasing data. Uh, but looking at the data from so far this year, uh, we believe that um, the budget request, what the administration initially estimated is going to be closest to what is actually needed to renew these. So there's a few reasons for this. Um, higher costs are expected, like the main reason is because um, the program is continuing to absorb the extremely rapid increases in market rents in recent years. I think folks are um, very aware of the really high rent increases that have happened in the past few years. It's slowed down to some extent, right, in the past year or so, but, um, housing choice vouchers are still catching up. So for example, rents increased by 28% from June of 2020 to June of 2023, according to Zillow data, right? And so that's just private market. 
Um, and during that same time period, the average cost of a voucher only increased by 17%, which is you know 11% difference. So really vouchers are still kind of catching up and absorbing some of those costs. And this is very typical that voucher costs lag the rental market uh, because uh, vouchers are capped uh, at the fair market rent, those subsidy levels that HUD establishes at the beginning of each fiscal year. And to do that, they use retroactive rent data. So there's just always this, this bit of a lag. And looking forward, um, HUD announced their fair market rents for 2024 um, about a month ago, and they will again increase by 12% for 2024. And that's going to be really useful, again, in catching up to those rent prices, but it does mean that there are additional costs. Um, so even though rent costs aren't rising as much, we still need that big increase in fair market rents to make sure that vouchers are competitive in the rental market. Uh, another reason that there are higher costs is that housing agencies have been doing a lot of work and have been very successful in using a larger share of the vouchers that they administer, meaning that they're helping more people who need it. Um, so many folks with vouchers struggled to find homes that they could rent in the tight post-pandemic housing market that we've been living in. Um, but HUD and local housing agencies have really taken um, some big steps to make sure that vouchers are easier to use, including include, um, increasing fair market rents and just other efforts um, around providing services and housing navigation and other tools that housing agencies have to make it easier. Um, so these efforts, as well as kind of the combination of the uh, rental market easing a bit have helped housing agencies assist almost 22,000 additional families so far this year, which is really great. Um, so we want to make sure that that progress in utilizing the vouchers that are currently available can be maintained in the new year. Um, but if Congress doesn't provide enough funding, then again, fewer families are going to receive assistance overall, um, which is going to lead to increases in evictions and people experiencing homelessness. Um, and of course, you know, that's all just to maintain where we are at and looking forward, um, we need to continue to push policymakers to expand rental assistance and provide other supports toward the goal of ensuring that all people with low incomes can have an accessible, affordable home. Um, so those are kind of the highlights from this blog that will be coming out soon, just really highlighting the need for some additional funding uh, than what is currently in either the House or the Senate bills. And again, um, kind of the costs associated with that, mainly that people, uh, fewer people will receive assistance. So I'll be on for just a few minutes longer. If folks have questions in the q and I can type in some answers. Thank you so much, Sonia. I really appreciated it. Um, you mentioned, I. I heard an estimate of how much fewer vouchers there would be on the Senate side. Did you mention the number of how many vouchers you would there would be fewer of on the House side if we get the House proposed budget? Yeah. So um, if the if Congress went with the House levels of renewing housing choice vouchers, it would mean that forty thousand fewer households households would receive vouchers. Again, that's not people actively losing assistance. It just means that 40,000 40, fewer households overall are receiving this critical assistance. And that's compared to 6,000 under the Senate proposal and ideally zero under the uh, president's budget request. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was gonna ask you to, to you had said it multiple times very responsibly uh, to make sure people knew that if you have housing assistance, this is not, this would not in any way impact your housing assistance that you're currently receiving. So I just want folks on the line, if they 
get a little anxiety from hearing that, that they they can know that this is not something that will be taking away assistance from currently from households that currently have assistance. It would be restricting access for people who are in need of assistance or working through the wait list um, sl more slowly. I do have a question though. What you're sharing this blog? We're going to share it with everybody um, after today's call once it's published. What's the most impactful thing that advocates on this call can be doing to make sure that whatever is passed in the final spending bill this year, that there is enough funding for all housing choice vouchers to get refunded? Yeah, I think making sure that um, folks are reaching out to their members of Congress about the importance of the program and the impact that it has in their communities, like sharing those stories is, is so important. So, you know, there's a there's a difference in stories here. Um, you know, for some programs, when there's a shortfall, it means that people actively lose assistance. And what we're talking about is slightly different. It's people not being able to receive that assistance. And so lifting up the impact that Housing Choice vouchers have had for people in your community, for you personally, for your family members, those sorts of things, um, as well as kind of talking about the larger state of affairs around lack of uh, affordable housing throughout the country. I think those are all really important. And, and you know, this ideally, this blog is like a helpful tool in that because um, you can pass it on to your members of Congress to say like, hey, this is something that you need to be aware of, um, that there might need to be a little bit more money in this account than folks were originally thinking. Thanks, Sonia. We're gonna talk a little bit more about all of the chaotic happenings on Capitol Hill later in the call, but there is a real risk, I think, a not zero risk that Congress might not be able to pass final spending bills this year. There's a, you know, a lot of open question about leadership in the House, uh, because they still haven't elected their speaker yet. Um, it, what would be the impact on house, the Housing Choice Voucher Program if, for example, Congress could only pass a full year continuing resolution? Yeah, that is a great question, Sarah. So um, as folks are probably aware, but just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, costs for housing choice vouchers and all rental assistance programs like project-based rental assistance, costs for those increase every year, right? Because our rents are increasing and other kind of costs related to inflation um, are all going up. So we need more money each year just to maintain where we're at. And so staying at the fiscal year 23 level or even going below that as would potentially happen under the um, debt ceiling agreement would be much worse um, than even the lower house bill. Um, and it would likely result in some people losing assistance and agencies not being able to um, pay the full year contract and all of those subsidies. We haven't done, um, that specific analysis, at least not updated for a while, so I don't have any numbers, but it would certainly be a lot worse. Um, and in the case of a continuing resolution, we would really need to push hard to get some additional funding in the bill. Um, it's called an anomaly added to a CR so that that would not happen um, because otherwise it would um, have an impact on people and as well as setting us farther back from our goals of making sure that people can have an accessible and affordable home. Just one more question if you have time for it. You mm -hmm. had mentioned that the reason why we're facing this very difficult budget climate right now is because earlier this year, President Biden and congressional leaders reached an agreement to lift the debt ceiling in exchange for very limited increases in spending for this year for FY24 and for next year, FY25. And this year is particularly hard because there's huge rent increases in communities. So the cost to renew rental assistance is higher. You, you went over that in really good detail, but there's also fewer, less money that's being generated by the FHA because of high interest rates. 
um, that could be used to offset HUD's budget. And next year, so we're already, we're talking about a huge shortfall this year of at least $13 billion. Next year, as part of the agreement, federal spending can only increase by 1%. Have you guys started to think about what the needs are gonna be next year or how much harder this problem is gonna get next year um, when we're facing similar disagreements over spending? Yeah, that's a great question. I will say that I don't follow like FHA receipts as closely. So I'm not sure if there are projections out there for next year about what that might be. And again, the, for, for folks um, just to level set, those that's basically income to uh, the government that helps kind of offset some of the spending. Um, it's usually kind of housed within transportation and the transportation and HUD bill, even though that money isn't used specifically for housing programs, right? It's more of just a general offset. Um, so I don't know if there are projections that perhaps there would be more income next year um, or not, but that could, again, potentially be an issue that we just wouldn't have as much money coming in from that source. And then of course, um, you know, every year we do expect rental assistance programs to need additional funding because of kind of the big increase, the big increase in funding from last year to kind of catch up with the fair market rents. And then ideally, if we're able to get what we need this year, in fiscal year 25, we might not need as much um, to catch up to rents because we've kind of done that work and rents are increasing at a much slower rate now. They're still high, which is why we need money this year to catch up to those high rents, but we hopefully won't need as much of a big jump next year. Unless of course, rents kind of skyrocket again, and then that's obviously a very different situation. But if they continue to kind of increase at a slower pace, then what we need to maintain assistance won't be as great. Um, but obviously it will be very tight and there will be a lot of decisions, hard decisions between programs that will need to be made. Um, it might mean that some of the block grant programs receive less funding. It could mean that there are cuts in other areas that are also really important for making sure that people have what they need to thrive. So um, certainly a lot to be concerned with for next year as well. Um, hard, to, hard to put any numbers on it, but it'll be difficult. Thank you, Sonia. We really appreciate you joining with us today. I should say to everybody on the call, if you don't know it, Sonia is an alum of the National Income Housing Coalition, and we still think of her like she's one of our own. So thank you for joining, Sonia. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be with you all. Take care. Talk to you soon. We're gonna move on to our next speaker, who is Sarah Abdelhadi from NLHC, who's gonna share uh, a new database that she helped create that all of you might find really helpful in your advocacy. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yep, that's perfect. Um, so uh, we are really, really excited to release the latest update to the Rental Housing Programs Database. Um, some of you may have used this in the past um, and it's taken us a while to update because that darn pandemic got in the way, but better late than ever, we're really excited to share with you all. Um, I'm gonna drop a couple of links in the chat just for you all to access while I'm walking through this. Um, we're just gonna do a quick overview of the methodology we use to update the, the database this year, um, some of our key findings, and then we'll do kind of a show and tell with the database webpage. Um, so if y'all have any questions, please feel free to drop them Q&A and we'll get to those after the presentation. Um, next slide, please. So for those who may not know, the Rental Housing Programs Database is essentially a collection of information on state and locally funded programs that create, preserve, or increase access to rental housing. Um, it originates from a report that was released back in 2001 called uh, A Patchwork of Small Measures. And the goal of that was, report was to understand the ways that state and local governments 
um, are using their own financial resources to try and bridge the gap between available federal funding for rental housing and the unmet needs of renters in their communities. Um, so there was a follow-up report released in 2008, and then in 2014, um, the coalition released the first interactive database um, that had all of the programs uh, captured available online for folks to explore. Um, so this is obviously a re really helpful resource for us to better advocate for increased federal funding uh, for uh, rental housing, but hopefully also a, a useful resource for you all, um, not only for your own advocacy, but also to kind of explore other programs that are out there, whether in your own states or in other states across the country, um, and maybe even to collaborate with folks who have similar concerns in their communities and explore, um, you know, new uh, initiatives that you might be able to uh, implement, um, best practices, lessons learned, all of that. So um, we're really excited to make it available to you. Next slide, please. Um, so just a, a really quick overview of our methodology in a nutshell. Um, to update the rental housing programs database, we first made a huge list of programs that might potentially be eligible for it. So this was including the list of programs we had in our 2014 database. Um, and we did a deep dive through internet search to find other programs. So we looked across all states, the District of Columbia and the largest cities in the US. So it was the 50 largest cities overall by population. And for any states that didn't have one of those largest cities, we looked at the largest city in that state. So 70, sta 70 cities total. Um, and we dug into every corner of the internet that we could think of to uh, put this list together. Um, we looked at state and local departments of housing and community development, um, health and human services, housing finance agencies, housing trust funds, um, and, and similar agencies at the state and local level. Um, we also found uh, very helpful the list of programs related to housing that were created or funded with Treasury State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. Uh, Treasury has been keeping a pretty good list of those programs, so that was really helpful to us as well. Um, so at that point on, we had a pretty big list. Uh, we reached out to the contacts that were associated with those programs and invited them to complete a survey to provide information on their programs. So the objectives of the program, um, eligibility and priority uh, information, target populations, and other characteristics through a survey monkey online survey. Um, so we got a great response, uh, but there were still many programs that we did not hear back from. So my colleagues at the research team here at the coalition uh, very kindly helped me to conduct some web-based re research to dig up as much information as we can could on the remaining programs um, to fill out the database. Next slide, please. So at the end of the day, we identified nearly 600 programs that might be a good fit for the RHPD. And we had to uh, limit that quite a bit. So we focused on uh, programs that provided specific sorts of uh, funding for rental housing, um, namely rental assistance programs. Um, so those could be tenant-based programs where the assistance moves with the tenant, project-based programs where the assistance is tied to the property or both, um, programs that provide capital resources for construction or purchase, rehabilitation, um, or other, uh, other sorts of funding for rental units. Um, some programs that provide both of these things, which we refer to as combination programs, uh, as well as tenant tax relief programs, which provide tax credits for renters as a way to sort of offset the costs of property tax that are passed on to them through rent. Um, for the purposes of the RHPD, we excluded certain programs. Um, so any that are funded solely through federal funds, uh, except for Treasury SLFRF, and I'll explain why in just a second. Um, so all of the programs you might be thinking of associated with HUD in particular, HOME, ESG, HOPWA, programs of that nature, those were excluded. So we only wanted to capture those that have some state or, or local funding included. Um, we made an exception for SLFRF just because it's such a flexible funding source. Um, state and local governments were given a lot of leeway in how they use these funds, and we know that many of them have chosen to invest in housing programs. Uh, so we thought it would be important to capture that in this iteration of the RHPD. Um, we also excluded programs that are not currently active, so either those that have been, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, 
state and state legislatures, city ordinances have um, enacted these programs, but they've not yet been implemented. Um, and also programs that may have, um, you know, run out of funding without securing additional funding sources. Um, some ERA programs are a really good example of this. Uh, if they're still relying on ERA funds without having transitioned to a state or local funding source, um, then they would not be included in the database this round. Um, we also excluded programs that didn't have a focus on rental housing. Uh, so there's some really fantastic initiatives out there that are focused on providing services to persons experiencing homelessness. Um, but if they didn't have a rental housing component, we did not include them in this database. Next slide, please. So after all of that, um, we ended up with 353 active state and locally funded rental housing programs as of August 2023. Um, we found programs in 48 states in the District of Columbia and 41 of the cities that we examined. Um, this is up from 313 total programs in 2014, so quite a big jump. Um, we did not find any programs in Arkansas or Wyoming, so statewide programs or programs in Little Rock, Arkansas or Cheyenne, Wyoming. So if you know of any programs in those states or those cities, please reach out to me. We really did our best to find them, but we could not identify any. Um, but we wanna represent any great work going on in those locations, so please let us know. Um, and I guess one thing just to flag on that note is that, uh, you know, a limitation of this work is a lot of it's web-based. Um, we really relied on contact information that we were able to find on the internet or any additional information. So uh, we think there could be quite a few more programs out there that just don't have websites available or maybe, um, you know, other documentation available online to help support this work. So if you are looking and you know there's a program in your area that's funded by state or local government and should be included, please reach out to us and let us know because we'd love to include it. And I will share some contact information later in these slides. Um, next slide, please. So we found that over half of the programs identified through this work provided capital resources only. So they're focusing on um, increasing or preserving rental housing units rather than providing direct assistance. Um, and if you include combination programs in this count, it's even more. Um, Tenant-based rental assistance programs were the second most common type of program we identified, and that's true at both the state and local level, as well as across the board. Um, so tenant tax relief programs were only found at the state level, which is perhaps not surprising. They're usually tied to state income tax, uh, tax filings or um, other information provided through that process. Um, and there were, I think, surprisingly few rent, project-based rental assistance programs that we found through our research, but we suspect there are maybe more um, that just are not kind of uh, shared in a publicly available way. Um, so we really appreciate any feedback you have, and we have a report as well. I linked to it earlier in the chat, and I will show you how to access it on our webpage in just a second. Um, you can find much more information on each of these types of programs uh, as well as funding for rental housing programs um, and other really interesting findings. Next slide, please. Um, so this video just provides a quick walkthrough of the webpage. Um, you can access it at nlihc.org slash rental dash programs. Um, and you can see, we just have a quick overview of what this page is. Um, there are links as well to the current 2023 report, um, which I just referenced with all of our findings. You can also see the 2001 and 2008 reports as well if you're curious about what rental housing programs looked like quite a long time ago now. I don't even want to count how many years ago that is. Um, there are instructions available here for any of you who would like to share this page with some of your colleagues or others in your network, and we really encourage you to do so. Um, our webpage is set up in a way where there's a map. Um, you can hover over states to see how many programs are in those states. We have filters, and then there's a web a web-based database that's interactive. Um, so if you interact with the map, you can zoom to Alaska or Hawaii. Definitely don't want to leave those states out. They're very important. Um, and you can zoom back to the continental US. Um, and like I said, you can hover over any of the states to see a count of programs. Um, you can click on a state to filter or use the filters below. Next 
So if we click on California, um, you'll see that all of the programs are filtered just for California. And you can click between the different pages. Um, you can click on column headers just to sort alphabetically if it's helpful when you're looking through programs. And you can click on any um, program name to see more and hover over the columns for a little bit more information on what that means. Uh, so if you click on a column name, you'll, uh, a program name, excuse me, you'll see more details on the program. And there will be as many fields here as we have data for. So some programs we just weren't able to get that much information for, and some we were able to get a lot. Um, but almost all of them have a program website attached. Many of them have contacts available. So if you want to reach out to the program administrators, you can um, and, and make those connections. So if we reset the filters, um, you'll see that the web page will just reload. Um, if you want to search by program type, you can. So let's say tenant-based rental assistance. Um, search by programs with 30% uh, area median income or less as the income threshold for tenants. Hit search. And you'll see the map adjusts for the programs that we've identified. And you can see that full list. Um, so. Uh, a really interesting feature is that the URL will also update. So if you want to you know, filter for a specific type of program, you can copy and paste that link and the person who opens it will be able to see exactly the results you're seeing, which is really nice. Um, but if you want to share the full database with someone, just make sure to hit the reset button. Um, you can also download all of the data we have. There's also some additional fields that are not included in that detail pop-up. Um, so if you click that export list button, it'll give you an Excel file. And you can see, um, you can either have it filtered specifically. So if we were to download it now, it would include just tenant-based rental assistance programs at 30% AMI, or you hit the reset button and you can have the full list of 353 programs. So that's our uh, rental housing programs database. We're really excited to get it out to you. We've gotten many questions over the past several months asking when an update's gonna come out. Um, so we're really excited to hear your feedback, your questions, um, anything you have, any program updates for sure, please email us, research at nlihc.org. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is super helpful. I hope a lot of folks on this call use this database. Maybe you can share what are some anticipated ways that you think folks across the country might use the database for? Sure, so um, a question we got recently actually uh, was about funding and dedicated funding streams for programs. Um, we uncovered some really interesting funding streams for a few programs. Um, I like to single out Colorado. Uh, they have a couple of programs that are funded through taxes um, on marijuana sales and another program that's funded through um, donations actually through state income taxes. So folks can opt in to donate to a fund that supports one of the rental housing programs. Um, so, you know, sometimes that information is not always available. Um, some state agencies in particular make it pretty difficult to access uh, information on funding for these programs, but what we were able to find is really interesting and we think it'll be helpful for others as well. Yeah, so that's cool. So people don't just have to look uh, they might not just look at their own state of what their own state is doing, but they can look across other states and how they're addressing the housing crisis. What are some unique ways that they might be creating programs or funding programs, as you say, so that they can bring those ideas back to their state and try to work on them there. That's very cool. And I did know we talked about this a little bit in our staff meeting, but there is, because you're able to look for rental assistance programs, it could be helpful for people who are in need of rental assistance and want to look at it, but you did make a big caveat, and I wanted you to be able to share that with folks on the call today, too. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, it can be a really helpful use or a really helpful resource for folks who are looking for assistance firsthand, so especially tenants who are in need of rental assistance. But um, as Sarah mentioned, I do want to flag that we are not updating this on a continuous basis. So we might add more programs in, but we are not going back through and making sure that you know our eligibility criteria is up to date. 
um, on a continuous basis. So uh, it could be helpful to, you know, share a filtered list with someone to say these might be programs that are active in your area right now. Um, but just be sure to flag that the requirements shown here may not be correct. Um, but, you know, we have the links to the web pages, so it can be really helpful if someone's just looking for, you know, how to, where resources might be, um, but just keep that caveat in mind. That's awesome. Super helpful. And if folks on the line have any questions or feedback for Sarah, they can follow up at research at NLIHC.org. I know that she and the team have been um, gathering feedback so that for future updates, they sort of know what's most important to advocates on the ground. So if you have ideas, don't be shy and share them with Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Wonderful. Okay, we're gonna move on to our first field update. Jessica Bellamy from Kentucky. Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. I'm gonna put up, I have a slide deck. Wonderful, thank you. Hi everyone, I hope you are doing well on this Monday. Appreciate everyone's time. Co-governance and passing oh, public policy. Whoa, I do not want it to play audio. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, all right, uh, I'm just going to jump in and hopefully can folks not hear any sound playing? Just double checking. But, I don't um, hear any sound, just you, just your voice. Good, good. Uh, so hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Bellamy. I'm a tenant organizer with the Louisville Tenants Union. Uh, the Louisville Tenants Union, we are based in Kentucky, and we are a rapidly gro growing multiracial and multi-generational base of poor working class tenants. Uh, we have folks from both public housing, trailer parks, we have bank tenants, which are homeowners, oftentimes living on lower fixed income, uh, who are trying to remain in their communities. Uh, and so we are working together to build power, uh, not only in our city, uh, but across our state of Kentucky and across the country uh, with the Campaign for Homes Guaranteed. Just to give you a little bit of information about um, our national campaign, when I talk about fight, we understand that yes, the rents are not only too damn high, but it is an unstable market in which our response needs to be to either stabilize it, reverse it, or help move us to a new market, hopefully uh, one of social housing, because we see lots of success, not only across uh, this nation, but in other places as well. And so our role as the Louisville Tenants Union within the Homes Guaranteed Campaign is bringing our organizing methodology and skills, all of the tenants in which uh, are already fired up uh, to, to be present and to start creating a national place for a conversation around rent control. We were part of bringing the first delegation of tenants that have ever visited the White House to the White House and since then have brought hundreds of tenants. When we talk about what does it mean for us to stabilize or get control of this housing market, that means changing policy and practices. And those who have always had the greatest control over policy and practices have been those who have had the greatest access uh, to resources, th those who have greater access to the real estate market itself. These are our landlords, oftentimes connected even with corporate development projects. And so we as tenants, the way that we see our role in uh, uh, changing this is that we ourselves must be activated in writing policy ourselves, uh, as well as being elected into spots that really Really make a difference in passing critical legislation. And so our local policy campaign focuses on just that. In Louisville, Kentucky, we got tired of waiting for our politicians to write policy that would secure our right to remain in our communities. Oh, I wanted to change slides. Are you oh, interested? No. So sorry, y'all. In creating meaningful and sustainable I'm just going to stop screen sharing because I don't know why it's not allowing me just to transition. Change in your community? Every time. Um, no. Okay. Let's try one more time to get this slide deck to work. If I just need to show it on this mode, I don't mind. 
I hope that other folks don't mind as well. Screen mode, great. All right, yes. So in Louisville, Kentucky, we got tired of waiting for our politicians to write policy that would secure our right to remain in our homes and in our communities. Being from a rapidly gentrifying black neighborhood called Smoketown, I was on fire to organize residents from across not only my neighborhood, but other neighborhoods that were like mine um, uh, around our shared self-interest. With support from the office of Councilman Jacory Arthur, together over the course of two years, we worked hard and wrote the Historically Black Neighborhood Ordinance, which today, now that we've connected with so many neighborhoods across our city, is now an ordinance that reflects not only the protection of Black neighborhoods, but all neighborhoods that are vulnerable from displacement in our city. It is now a citywide ordinance called the Anti-Displacement Ordinance, which we have multiple council members jumping on to support. This is the first anti-displacement policy in our city, in our state, and anywhere in the South. Since the launch of our public facing policy back in February, we have grown a, a lot of support around this ordinance. Between the handwritten and digital, digital signatures, uh, we have over 1,500 tenants and allies who've signed on for the fight, over 50 allied organizations, including our local ACLU Kentucky, our Urban League, Fairness Campaign, and more. Uh, we have multiple Metro Council sponsors who have already signed on to be co-sponsors uh, and who are waiting in the wings to get on into this next revised edition launching in uh, 2024. What does our ordinance do? It creates protections for residents and small business owners living in areas that are vulnerable to displacement due to gentrification. Gentrification of poor and working class neighborhoods has rapidly increased our, uh, our local, uh, it's been rapidly increased because our local government has been supporting it and pouring in so many resources such as our public dollars, our public land and staff support. Many of the developers that are using these materials are building unaffordable housing unchecked. They're building for folks that are making 80% AMI and trying to call it affordable when our communities are itself are generally 30% AMI uh, or even below. Many of these developers who are using these subsidies uh, have been able to do this for years. These, these types of developments have increased rents in our areas, property taxes, have increased the predatory activity of uh, homeowners getting bombarded with fines and fees uh, that suddenly come out of nowhere from code and regulations to try to outprice them from their home, make it too unaffordable uh, for them to stay and force them to inevitably sell at very, very low prices. This has become the model for the housing market across the country. You can go into our communities because the property values are already low, buy low, and then sell high. And you can get access uh, to, um, to city dollars and city land so you don't even have to use your own money, even though most of these developers uh, have their own access to resources and definitely greater access to financing and lending uh, opportunities in our areas. So the anti-displacement ordinance if passed, we'll work to stop this and create pathways for these resources to go where they need to go and for opportunities to be created for people already living in our communities that are starved uh, from these resources, not getting to their hands. At its heart, our ordinance prevents our local government from giving public land, money, and staff support to projects that will displace us so that those resources can actually be used for the type of housing that we do need uh, and that our assessments in our city keep telling us to put resources towards. It also prioritizes residents and small business owners in our areas that are vulnerable of displacement to get access to city programs that the city already offers, such as the down payment assistance program, home repair program, and the small business assistance program. It also creates a pathway for families whose land was wrongfully taken by the government to launch an investigation with support of the, House, the Human Relations Commission. 
our HRC already handles the internal discrimination cases inside of our Metro government. And in the case of these land investigations, they will be providing the much needed support that so many families who've lost their homes due to debt piling up and liens and other things. Um, from, from those moments of displacement, those opportunities to force families into forced closure, uh, if we can repair those things, we should. And actually our city has made a commitment to do just that, but has not processed for families to be able to launch their investigations. So this ordinance actually creates that missing puzzle well. Our ordinance is so progressive that we've made local, national uh, and statewide We've been featured in Jacobin, Next City, and many other publications. As a result, people from around the country have started to reach out to us at the Louisville Tennis Union. Uh, folks from Ocean Springs, Mississippi, for example, who see this policy and how it could benefit people in their communities. A few weeks ago, we even presented our strategy for base building and power building to a series of Kentucky organizers at a statewide conference we definitely need to be exposing our practices, uh, the ways in which we're building power here in such a tough environment to build momentum in uh, with other organizers across this country, which is why I'm so excited that we are on this clock today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and for folks that are interested in seeing policies like what I've just talked about getting passed, ones written by poor and working class people uh, who are tenants in this country, then we would love your support. I'm gonna paste in the chat uh, uh, a link to our main webpage for the campaign. If you'd like to sign the petition, if you would like to support by sharing any of our posts online, I want to also share our email address because if you know of any organization that is interested in participating in policy with as much vigor and seriousness as we are, then we're here to help mentor and support those groups as well. Um, I thank you for your time. Sorry for all the technical mishaps. No worries, thank you so much, Jessica, for joining with us. I see a lot of comments in the chat box. People are really happy that you're here to share all the great work that you're doing. I did have a couple of questions. I'm gonna encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A box so that we can ask them to Jessica and our other speakers. But you mentioned a little bit about how you have your own very specific organizing methodology. I'm wondering if you could share maybe one or two tips for folks who are maybe just getting started in this work. Absolutely. Uh, so we were trained and mentored uh, by organizers like John Washington, who's out of Buffalo. He also works for uh, Homes. He works for Homes Guaranteed, uh, and Tara Ragavir, who's also with Homes Guaranteed. Um, and this training methodology centers on the practice of one-to-ones agitations and building like real and honest relationships with each other. Um, it's about getting clarity around self-interest because oftentimes uh, folks do not see themselves in these pieces and these works that we're talking about. Because I guarantee you for as many of us on this call, who else was feeling messed up about the ever increasing rise of rents uh, and how close it might even come to home. Uh, so identifying it clear on that is important as well as getting very clear on what power is and what it isn't because even our definitions of what power is uh, oftentimes hold us back from wielding it at all because our understanding comes from how we experience power which often comes from uh, oppressors, you know, power being wielded against us or over us. Um, so, there's a lot to say about it, but that's like <laughs> some quick snippets. I guess. But I'll be a little, a little preview to a longer conversation. Hopefully, we can have with you and others on future calls. But I don't see any other questions in the chat box. But I will say, other than people wanting to get your contact information, which you shared yes. in the chat box, people should check that out. There's also a link that Jessica shared to the, um, so that you can follow the campaign. Uh, so feel free to follow up with her or check that out. And I just wanted to thank you again for joining with us today. Really appreciate thank the you. time. And thank you all for your flexibility. My technical issues are wild today. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm the least technologically savvy person, you know, person on staff and they still let me talk on this call. So no worries, take care. We're gonna go to our next speaker as well, um, who's giving a field update from Nebraska, Dr. Aaron Feichtinger from the Omaha Women's Fund. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, you know, close enough. Um, it's okay. Don't worry about it. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Erin Feitschinger. I'm the policy director for the Women's Fund of Omaha in the uh, deeply red and often backward state of Nebraska. Um, I was asked on to talk about the fact that Nebraska just recently, um, and this might be shocking to some folks, but just recently accepted its allocation from Treasury of the second round of emergency rental assistance um which everybody else accepted in probably 2021 now we have five era programs in nebraska omaha and lincoln have their own programs those are our two biggest cities um, on the east side of the state and then douglas and lancaster are where those cities are located and then the statewide program represents the entire rest of the state or 91 counties <clears throat> now when the first round of emergency rental assistance uh, round two was made available in 2021 we quickly realized in September of that year that the state of the Nebraska was not making any moves at all to accept um, the available funds from Treasury which at that time amounted to 121 million dollars um, that could have been used in those 91 counties the governor's office at that time when we started talking to them um, made it clear that they would not be asking for the funds so we would lose 121 million because as they kept saying there was no need it was being used um, that was like what they decided to use as a political football our governor was about to start running for the u.s senate as a deep um, you know fiscal conservative who didn't need federal funding we're not a welfare state all of those things um so when we knew that we weren't going to be able to convince him uh we moved in the 2022 legislative session uh, to introduce legislation that would require that the governor accept those funds from treasury um we brought in advocates from across the state so representing everywhere from like basically the Colorado border um, to every other county uh, organizations that did work in those counties came and testified um, on the necessity of that bill. The governor's office doubled and tripled down in that hearing and um, really kind of cut off their own noses to spite their face in that hearing and ended up sort of galvanizing because of their behavior and general disdain for um, people in Nebraska. Uh, ended up galvanizing a lot of senators to our side and we ended up passing that legislation in 2022, but the governor vetoed it and we lost the veto override vote by one. So we had no emergency rental assistance funds in the st in 91 counties in Nebraska. Um, and we what that vote also meant was that we missed the deadline to apply for emergency rental assistance round two and ended up losing close to $80 million of our initial allocation. And that was really stupid. And a lot of people in rural Nebraska and organizations across the state got hurt as a result of that decision. Um, we kept working on it though. We brought stakeholders from across the state together in a small group to design a better ERA program that we could present to the new governor. <clears throat> Our former governor is now in the US Senate. He's bought himself quite the seat of obscurity and our new governor um, came in kind of fresh. And we were attempting to show that we could actually design a program for the state that could run efficiently and utilize the funds. Because one of the things that the former governor had said was that there was no need. But the reason it looked like there was no need was because we had designed such a cumbersome and ridiculous program that no one could access the funds that they actually needed. And I'm sure that's probably <laughs> seems uh, or is familiar to a couple of people working in states like mine. Um, we we reintroduced a bill this last legislative session in January 2023 
the same bill to force the governor to accept ERA 2. We didn't actually end up needing a vote on it. All we needed was a slew of culture war bills that resulted in a session long filibuster of every single bill that came through and a governor who desperately needed that filibuster to stop for just a second so he could pass his beloved ethanol tax credits. And we were there when he needed that moment and the governor signed the letter that day um, to get the funds into Nebraska. Um, the So I mentioned that story just because I think it's, you know, of course there's a lot of like deep advocacy and um, organizing and sort of sustained and diligent pressure that went on um, that led us to a moment where when the governor needed something, we were able to give him that thing in exchange for what um, we also wanted. And sometimes politics just works like that. The program, the ERA2 program um, that we currently have in the state is not without its problems, um, but it did launch at the beginning of this month and it already has had over 2,000 applicants across 70 counties. Um, over half of those applicants have children in the household and a not insignificant number of them have a um, prioritization for um, trying to leave a domestic violence situation. So despite all of the official talking points that there was no need in Nebraska, the program has already reached more counties than our first ERA-1 program ever did. And it doesn't look exactly like we wanted, um, but it is a program and it's a better one than we had with ERA-1. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we're gonna keep monitoring it, keep monitoring the implementation um, with the state government, particularly ours. Uh, there's like, you know, a very healthy mix of um, laziness and incompetence, if not outright malice towards citizens in need. So um, it's good that we have groups and organizations across the state who are um, monitoring it and making sure that the money is going where it needs to go, reaching who it needs to reach. Um, and although the first round of this fight, the idea that it took us two years to get this money into the state is so ridiculous. Um, I'm proud of the work that we were able to do here and the amount of people that came to the table who had never engaged with their elected officials before that fight. So uh, I didn't think of an elegant way to end this conversation. So I mean, that's and scene, I guess. So if anyone has Thank questions. You. Yeah, I mean, I think you, I mean, not every success um, looks the same in, in the world of advocacy. And I think there's two really like important things I picked up from your story. One is that like doing all the work you can so that you're in the right spot at the right time. That's a lot of what politics is. And so kudos to you and others who worked really hard to build those relationships, to um, build the advocacy that you needed so that you were able to take advantage of that opportunity when it came to you mm -hmm. and then the second is just how a lot of this work is just continual improvement we're not it's it's hard to get to the the end goal of what we want but sometimes we can make really important steps along the way and so just appreciate all the work that you've been doing there is a question from carrie hill who wanted to know how do you seek out allies or organize in such a restrictive environment yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've been doing housing policy work in Nebraska for five years or so, and we really didn't have any sustained coalitions working on housing advocacy until like just before COVID. Um, but we were able to build out fairly quickly I mean, I basically, I just run like a Google listserv, um, you know, whatever, like the simplest mode of technology that you possibly can use to like mass communicate with people. Uh, and we've been able to build that up through just word of mouth. Um, and we've got, I mean, we've got representation in that group, hundreds of organizations and not always all working together, right? But just in terms of like, this is a thing that's happening. Here's a bill that we're introducing here's, you know, 
how to engage your elected officials. If you need help doing that, here's this organization, this person, this person, and just like informally over the years have been able to build out that coalition of folks. Uh, and it's shocking the amount of people like from the diverse political spectrum who are engaged in this work. Like there's a woman out in the middle of the state who uh, her and I do not have the same politics, but she runs an organization and like took this up as her, like she was going to the ends of the earth for this. So she'd roll into the Capitol with her like venti latte and her, you know, scarf and just being like, I'm going to the governor's office, you know, like these kinds of people. And then that, that ends up bringing in more and more. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but it really is just keeping folks informed, encouraging them to uh, get engaged, giving them as much tools in terms of just like basic education of this is how the legislature works. Here's how you find your senator. Um, here's how you get to the Capitol and where to park. And like, <laughs> here's how you talk to them, like when they're on the floor. Uh, it has really broken down a lot of barriers in that way. So we've got a fairly impressive group of housing advocates at this point um, in the state that we can call on at any given moment. So ERA, the ERA fight has really been a great organ, not organizing tool, but, you know, a sort of coalescing of folks who otherwise would not have been engaged. So thanks to our former governor, I guess, for getting us all together in our disdain for him. <laughs> so like to bring us bring us together Sometimes tough times bring people together in new ways so we really appreciate your work uh Aaron and thanks for joining with us on today's call and hopefully we'll hear back from you soon about new and even better uh organizing that you're doing in your state to achieve great things thanks for having me and my email's wrong on this so just send it out like differently I guess if folks want to get I'll drop it in the chat how about that Okay, great. And then we'll make sure we fix it before we send it out to people. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. So next on our agenda is a, uh, an update on Capitol Hill from me. We talked a little bit about that earlier with Sonia about how things are sort of still in limbo with the FY24 spending bills. We have just about four legislative weeks left before the current continuing resolution expires. Um, that means that Congress has until November 17th to either pass another continuing resolution to keep the government open, to pass final spending bills, or they're going to risk a government shutdown. So there's a short window of time to take action, and there's a lot up in the air, and Congress is a little um, chaotic right now. So I'll start with what's happening on the House side. Uh, you may have seen that we still do not have a Speaker of the House. It's been several weeks now uh, without this leadership. And as a result, really no business can happen or take place in the House without a speaker. Um, after Republicans ousted Kevin McCarthy as our Speaker of the House, there it looked like it could be Steve Scalise. And then last week, it looked like it could be Jim Jordan. Now it looks like Republicans are going back to the drawing board to try to find who could be somebody that would garner the support of their very diverse and um, uh, what's the word? Their caucus that's not united on exactly who they should be electing. So there are nine Republicans who are now in the race for the speakership. It's really unclear whether or not any of them can garner enough support uh, in order for them to become speaker. Um, and we know that I think at this point, many members of Congress are very frustrated um, that this has been going on so long and some hope that they can try to figure out a solution to this um, by the end of this week. So we shall see. Once they choose a speaker, it is likely that we'll start to see appropriations bills move more quickly. Right before Speaker McCarthy was ousted, um, the House was set to take up its transportation housing bill and several amendments uh, and bring it to the House floor for a vote. So once the speakership is decided, we could see those bills and amendments get a vote. Um, that gives us as advocates extra time to be weighing in with members of Congress, not only about the fact that the House bill doesn't provide enough funding. We heard from Sonia who said uh, it does not provide enough funding to even just to serve the same number of people who are being served through the Housing Choice Voucher Program. 
but there are also really harmful amendments that have been offered. It's unclear which of those amendments are going to actually get a vote on the House floor, um, but it does it does worry me. And so we will be reaching out to offices. I encourage you to as well to tell them that we really cannot see any amendments that would further cut HUD funding that would restrict access to HUD programs or make it more difficult for HUD to um, use best practices for administering programs or to advance racial equity. Those are really the four areas that we see a lot of very harmful amendments um, being offered. On the Senate side, I think we're also likely to see they're not unencumbered by the speakership race. They can still uh, move on their bills. And we hear that they might take up a mini bus, which is a collection of three spending bills, including one for transportation HUD, uh, that they might take that up as soon as this week. We've also seen amendments offered to that bill, although fewer ones. Uh, and again, it's also unclear which of those amendments would get a, um, a vote on the Senate floor, um, but uh, largely similar or overlapping with what we saw on the House side, though, though fewer of them. So what is it that you guys can do now? I think we have a unique window of opportunity between now and November 17th to be trying to make as strong of a case as possible for why we need final spending bills. We need the highest, fun, uh, uh, highest amount of funding possible for HUD programs. And we need to get rid of all of these or vote no on any of these amendments that would just make it harder for people to access the housing assistance that they need. So I encourage all of you to reach out to your members of Congress. You can also sign on to a national letter that we have circulated along with other national organizations that are a part of the campaign for housing and community development funding. My colleague Elena just shared a link to that sign on letter in the chat box. There are about 2,100 organizations, local, state, and national organizations that are on that letter. Uh, but if you're not on it, you should sign on to it and share it with your other friends and ask them to join on too. So I am going to pause there to see if there are any questions for us about what's happening on Capitol Hill. And it does not seem like there is. So we can end today's call. And just a reminder, we'll share a copy of the presentation, the PowerPoint, and any materials that folks mentioned. We'll share that in an email to folks after today's call. And I look forward to talking to you guys in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Take care.